Um, just also that uh, oral evidence sessions will be recorded and reported by Hansard. Uh, so we can go to item three then, which is the uh, draft minutes, uh, for, which are on page six of our meeting from the 19th of February. Uh, are you content that that's a true reflection of the meeting? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, we'll sign those. Um, matters arising. I don't have any matters arising. Is anybody else any? No. Okay. Okay, then we move to item uh, five, which is the Brexit issues, uh, including the work of the Brexit subcommittee. It starts on page 11 of the meeting pack. At this point, great. I can welcome uh, Karen Pearson, the Director of Future EU Relations from the Executive Office, and Andrew McCormick who is the Director General of the International Relations and the Executive Office. You're very welcome along here today. Thank you very much for coming up to us. Um, just to note that Hansard will be recording everything that is um, taking part in this discussion today. Um, maybe what we could do then is, if we pass over to yourselves to give us some opening remarks and some update, then what we can do is we'll have some questions then afterwards for you. So thank you very much and we'll pass on to yourselves. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks for the chance to be with the committee this afternoon. Um, uh, as, as you say, we'll, we'll say a little bit about some of the key issues that we're dealing with, and then uh, happy to get into a, in, into a discussion about all of that. I think um, FM and DFM probably covered some aspects of preparations for EU exit at their first appearance a few weeks ago. Um, maybe let's just say a word or two on the wider international relations side as well, just and then um, turn to Brexit and then Karen can, can supplement that with, with some extra points as well. So we have, uh, as a devolved administration, three overseas offices, uh, Washington, Beijing, uh, well, which is vacant at the moment because Tim lost his from home, obviously, with all that's going on there. Uh, and Brussels, Brussels is the largest, long, probably the longest established. Um, and those offices are designed to complement what Invest Northern Ireland, Invest Northern Ireland has a much wider network of offices because promoting trade and investment is a wider economic function. The three are chosen because that's where the most important government to government relationships happen and that's why that's appropriate to the civil service as distinct from uh, Invest Northern Ireland. Uh, so um, we also have a responsibility in, in my team for the inward visits and there's been a wide range of, of overseas visitors I think great interest in the region in the last few years. Uh, lots of people wanting to visit the border. Um, that's been a major pattern. Um, we've posted, I think, far, far more visits in the last few years than has been the regular time. And they're always interested in economic issues, tourism, and some of the spe some of the specialised sectors that apply there. In terms of the Brussels office, um, a lot there to do with promoting our interests there, the executives' issues. And um, that's been really, of course, of great interest at the present time. Um, but good work by the team there to build and establish long-term networks that have value of value to the region. So we've got good contacts, good contacts with the Commission, the other institutions, the Parliament, uh, the member state delegations, and some of the other regions that are represented. Because Brussels has offices from all over the world, in term, because they, they, that's where they deal with with the EU on a, a, a collective basis. Um, you mentioned the, the, um, the work of the Executive Subcommittee. Um, and that's was committed to be established in New Decade, New Approach. Uh, we've just come from uh, literally, literally the fourth meeting of that subcommittee and the secretary of that, that subcommittee. And uh, they've had a lot of briefings so far on trade, on uh, the agriculture side, the sanitary and phytosanitary issues, SPS as we call them, fisheries, justice and transport. And I think the work program uh, is, is shows that some of the forward look that, that they have. The next phase and the big the big thing that's in the offing now are the negotiations between uh, UK government and the European Union on the, the future relationship. Uh, there are two very different perspectives on that. Um, so uh, we've seen the stall set out in the Prime Minister's Greenwich speech. Uh, I think the David Frost speech in Brussels was also quite important in signalling their position and you know, what's 
an opening negotiating position and what's a fundamental view of what they mean by independence and autonomy. Some, some quite important uh, lines being drawn there. Uh, just published then, following the General Affairs Council on Tuesday, was the final version of the European mandate. So again, uh, interesting to see, even the way that evolved from the draft at the start of the month, uh, the initial version produced by the Commission to what the <coughs> Council of Ministers has now currently approved as the European mandate <coughs> for that negotiation. So large gaps and very, very material issues for us at the highest level. Uh, the European Union side is to look for an overarching agreement, what's called an association agreement. So countries like Georgia, Ukraine have those that kind of agreement. That they're trying to get their way into the European Union, so it's a, a, it's the first step in that way. Um, so it's natural to see that as, as a, a, a natural consequence of, of leaving. Uh, but that one thing that, that involves is overarching governance. In other words, if there's a dispute in one part of the agreement that you can then tackle it in, in relation to another aspect of the agreement, so an overarching association agreement. Uh, the UK government's position, as has been clearly stated by Boris Johnson, is no to that. Uh, we'll have a, a look for a free trade agreement and then separate agreements on security, aviation, road transport, a whole range of other things, and then they'll also just behave as a third country. So they're saying, you know, we're independent, we're, we'll do our own thing, and as a third country we'll apply for, say, a data adequacy agreement or um, a, an agreement on financial services. So very, very important thing for UK economy, but they want to be, they, they want, they're choosing to be treated as a third country rather than bring those into an overarching agreement. So um, those, those, are, those are technical points in a way, but they reveal... I think they're consistent with the psychology of what's going on here, as in uh, a very assertive approach taken by the UK government to say, you know, we are now uh, adopting this autonomy. Autonomy is what we're looking for. This is this is about have, making our own rules, making our own laws, uh, taking con taking back control. So, in terms of our world, um, our, the, the executive's objective is to ensure that the outcome we get from this whole process, and there are many strands to it, is the best it can possible, possibly be. Um, we're working as closely as we can with uh, the Whitehall departments uh, to at least make sure that the issues here are understood and to the extent we can influence that, that's been, been the task, especially in the last three years. Uh, there's been then, since ministers have been back, correspondence and meetings where they're making their points and especially focusing on uh, the, the protocol, the way the protocol will be applied, it's a unique arrangement. Uh, it has a whole range of complex dimensions to it, and the the objective is to get get as good a, a resolution of all of those issues as possible. And indeed, uh, they went to the joint ministerial committee meeting on uh, JMCEM European negotiations uh, in, towards the end of January, and that secured an agreement that, that there'll be a a political level engagement on the development and application of the protocol. Um, that's that's consistent with what UK government committed in the New Decade New Approach document, so Annex A, paragraph 11, saying that we will aim to negotiate with the European Union additional flexibilities and sensible practical measures across all aspects of the protocol that are supported by the business groups uh, in Northern Ireland and maximise the free flow of trade. So that's a, a UK government undertaking the one that obviously the ministers and indeed I'm well aware that the, the MPs collectively have been working on this as well, uh, both before and after the um, uh, return of ministers. So we're working very t tightly and pr this is a very, very important time on these issues. Uh, the, the, the year ahead to the end of the transition period uh, will fly and, and there's an awful lot to be done to secure the region's interests. Uh, and the stakeholders have worked very, very effectively together and worked with the, the political parties and with, with, with the MPs at Westminster. Uh, and they've, they've been in this building, I think, this week a couple, at least a couple of times. So there's a lot of really good work being done by them as a group to um, identify what's best to be done, identify where the biggest issues and concerns will be, because there are you know, some very serious things that need to be addressed. But that's uh, certainly happy to get into 
the detail of all of that and, and what's going on in the withdrawal agreement and the application of the protocol to deal with that in, in, in questions. But maybe uh, uh, Karen just draw out some of the official level governance and, and as, as, aspects of that, please. That's okay. Thank you, Chair. Just going to say a few words about how we keep all this together um, across the civil service. Obviously, um, departmental ministers have their own responsibilities and their own autonomy that needs to come together through the executive subcommittee to get the best um, set of outcomes across the, the various negotiation <coughs> strands that Andrew just outlined. So our job in uh, the executive office is, is much more of a coordination strategy setting piece. Um, we provide the secretariat to the subcommittee, Andrew's the secretary and the deputy secretary. We also need to keep it together at a senior level across uh, officials. So we have a future relations board that's chaired by the head of the civil service where he checks in just to make sure various work streams are on track. Work streams include things like um, justice, preparedness, finance, protocol and trade and other implementation issues. We look across those um, as a whole. Um, as Andrew said, it's also absolutely vital we keep in touch with Whitehall because they're going to be leading on the international negotiations and we have to make sure our very special interests are recognised in departments. So we liaise bilaterally and Andrew and I then liaise with the centre departments in Whitehall just to make sure they understand what we're trying to achieve. And then in Brussels, Andrew mentioned the Bureau. We have the Executives Bureau um, providing abs absolutely first-class access and support to us out in Europe. Um, we very much look forward to keeping you up to date, Chair, as our work progresses this year. OK. Um, thank you very much indeed for um, that input. It's appreciated. Um, we're going to maybe open up now to members, um, and I'll start myself with just a few questions. and maybe just some clarity and concerns, maybe there have, that you can sort of help, help us to understand them. Um, I think the more that we investigate and, and learn about the outworkings of Brexit, it, it appears to be quite a complicated spider's web in terms of decision-making, uh, investigations, um, and then accountability for the decisions that are taken. So if there are decisions that are going to be taken that directly impact here in the North, Who's taken those decisions? And as important, what's the accountability for that decision-making process? Um, in some respects, it feels like some of that, well, most of that should fall uh, to the Assembly. And as a result of it being the Assembly, it's here, this committee, that will um, hold that account. Uh, an example for you know the protocol that is being developed, the annex that has some 300 uh, different pieces of legislation that will be um, put in place, but if there are changes to those um, protocols in any shape or form, we won't actually have any direct input to the actual changes that are made to that legislation. And the question is, what sort of um, input can we have? Uh, and, and as those changes are made, how can we hold those to account? I'll make a start on that, and Karen, Karen can help. Um, but the overarching governance <coughs> in relation to the withdrawal agreement uh, is through a joint committee uh, which is established by the, the withdrawal agreement and that in includes that's ba that will be based on very senior level representation from UK government and the European Commission and I think with the, the name of the uh, European side uh, lead has just been identified Michael Gove will lead so they, they that committee will have a number of decisions to take with in relation to the totality of the withdrawal agreement, because it affects a whole range of issues uh, uh, as well as the protocol, but then it'll, it'll at times be dealing with specific issues on the, on the protocol. The withdrawal agreement also creates a number of specialised committees, and there's one specifically dedicated to the protocol, and that so there's an article uh, within, the, within the protocol that defines what it can look at and what it can do. Um, and that that uh, provides a basis for d decision making and, and resolution of issues as they evolve. Because I think part of the whole issue here is that uh, the protocol can define today uh, those elements of the European legal system, the acquis as it's called, that, that are relevant to making the protocol work. So that that's, that can be defined. Hence the 300 pages. That's the existing list. But it, the obligation we have under the protocol is to retain uh, what's called dynamic alignment and that, that's the very thing that uh, the Prime Minister doesn't want for GB uh, but the protocol requires it here 
because otherwise uh, then the single market gets distorted. So there will be a need for that updating. Uh, some things will, will be, by virtue of the protocol, legally obliged to be put in here, and there will need to be a provision for the, the making of secondary legislation to keep the statute book up to date, because the, the, throughout, the, the, throughout all the years of membership, uh, because we have a dual legal system, as it were, a, a, a dual set of legislation, uh, there's a need for European law to be translated into domestic law, and, and that the, the Withdrawal Agreement Act provides a new basis on which that can be done. Uh, some bits will be, some bits affecting Northern Ireland will be matters for UK departments, and that'll that'll be a matter for them to do at Westminster. And some bits will be in the devolved space, and will therefore require. A, a steady flow, I would imagine, over the years, looking ahead, of updating of, of, of regulations uh, to, to maintain uh, the, the operation of the pro protocol uh, as intended. So, there, in terms of then um, accountability, and because most of that is is already committed, there's, there's an awful lot that, of, that is actually already already settled. Uh, that there are not actually so many big strategic level decisions that lie ahead for the Joint Committee. There, there's a, one, one that is very, very important, which is the definition of, the, of precisely what is meant by the term at-risk goods. So uh, a major part of the protocol is the uh, requirement that uh, EU tariffs are applied to goods which, are, which enter Northern Ireland from GB or indeed from the rest of the world, which are at risk of entering <coughs> the single market, and, that, and getting that defined and how that applies. That w the context for that will be set by what emerges in the higher level negotiations. So whether there are tariffs at all, if there's a zero tariff agreement, then that's that's not an issue. But if there are t there are tariff, dif tariff differentials, then that that becomes a very big issue, and one that the business community is very concerned about, and one that needs to be looked at. But that is for the Joint Committee. There's nothing, uh, no decision here. Uh, that's something which we'll actually just have to accept and work with. The, the actual important bit is how we work with UK Government and alongside UK Government with Brussels to make that as sensible as possible, to say this is, uh, to look at volumes, flows, how trade actually works in practical terms, to mean that the, the decision makers aren't taking things in the abstract, but informed by the real world, uh, informed by what's really going on on the ground, and therefore, to the extent possible, taking account of all the practicalities. So, so that that's uh, is, is a um, that's not formally part of the governance, but it's absolutely vital part of the the process is for us to get across and deal with, to engage, and, and explain. And the business community for, to do that themselves, uh, for that to be clear at UK government level and in the Commission. Sorry, it's already a long answer, but is, is there, is there okay. more need to I suppose that? maybe what there was in there was a considerable amount of, of detail on how the decisions are taken. Mm. And my query really is more about how is there an opportunity for scrutiny of those decisions, or is it a case that? The Joint Committee, and, and I think if I heard you right, there's a subcommittee of the Joint Special Committee yes. that will take decisions that will impact here. But I mean, is that is the accountability for those decisions through to Westminster, or if those decisions impact here, um, is there through that jo Joint Committee do, do Northern Ireland ministers participate in those discussions, and therefore then this place can can sort of hold some sort of scrutiny, but. As I mentioned about the spider's web, it yeah. feels like there's lots of different groups and lots of different subgroups and lots of different arenas that people are meeting to discuss things and potentially take decisions. But it's that it's holding that to account, as this is what this committee yes. structure in the assembly is to hold account those that are taking decisions. Yes. So, is there an opportunity for the assembly to to hold a scrutinising role for any of that decision making process? So that that would go as you say to the. Um, extent to which Northern Ireland ministers have a contribution to make to yep. the, deci the formal decision-making process. So the commitment in New Decade New Approach, Annex A, Paragraph 9, is that the government will ensure that representatives from the Northern Ireland Executive are invited to be part of the UK delegation in any meetings of the Joint Committee or the Specialised Committee where Northern Ireland specific matters are being discussed and where the Irish government is also in attendance. Yeah. So 
okay, that, that's the tip of the iceberg. What matters uh, is what's done in preparation and then how that's then held to account after, after the event. So before the event will be the important bit where, and one thing that is not yet defined are the rules of engagement and procedure. So it would be possible, for example, for those committees to say that before they take a decision, they would issue a draft decision and allow that to be discussed in some formal process. And that could come okay. here or to our ministers. Or and, and This is only possibility. This is, it's a matter for them to decide looking ahead. But in, in terms of the principles of good governance, uh, you know, it, it, one would not be uh, to uh, deal with issues by surprise. Uh, so therefore, and looking at the way uh, European legislation is made in the present time and the, the way it goes through the Parliament and all those processes, there is extensive process before decisions are actually crystallised. So I think that's that's what I think it's it's in our interests to look for that and, and maximise the opportunity for public consultation, and that would then provide the opportunity for okay. scrutiny in advance. I, I try not to keep going back and forward, but I think it's so important the, the points that we're raising here because it's potentially laying out the groundwork for, for the engagement of committees and the Assembly, so I think we, we should get a good understanding. Chair, would you mind if I come in just on that to make a small point? Yes, of course. Just in terms of the input from the executive to meetings that you were talking about, presumably reports will then go back to the subcommittee, the executive subcommittee. Yes. I'm wondering, is it possible for any reports from the subcommittee to be given to committees, be given to this committee, so that they'll, they'll and, and a forward work plan as well, so that we have an idea of, of where things are going? I think there's a, a, definitely room for, for forward work planning to be shared as, as, as in that space already. I think there'll, be, there'll probably need to be a distinction between matters which remain policy under consideration and therefore under, as, the, as a subcommittee in that context, the subcommittee would work on the same rules of confidentiality as the executive itself, but uh, there, there is, to me, a value and a, and, and a necessity to have a kind of engagement, and therefore, good practice would say, uh, putting these things, allowing there to be scrutiny and consideration <coughs> of proposals before decisions are finalised, is a, is a, a good principle, uh, and, and one that will need to be evolved. But we, we don't have. We, we, we don't have any clear picture as to what the rules of engagement at the higher level will be, and that will determine what's possible uh, at our level. But I think that's fair. No, I, I think matters are still evolving, to be honest, Chair. We, yeah. We, yeah. we couldn't today outline for you this is going to happen in this format with this attendance sure. um, precisely today, but you have a very clear interest. Yes. As soon as we've got clarity on that, we'll, we'll make sure. Uh, maybe just a, a, an appeal. <laughs> Do. Um, Will ministers, for example, if the minister, the DERA minister, was going off to participate in some subcommittee of the GNC, does that minister go off and take independent decisions? Or do those decisions have to be agreed by the Brexit subcommittee before that minister goes off to participate in the decisions or discussions over in, in Brussels or in Westminster? And therefore, as you know, Pat has said, then would that mean that that decision would be taken by the Brexit subcommittee and therefore could be scrutinised through here? Or, or do ministers just go over, take their decisions, be part of their departmental thoughts and then come back to the Brexit committee and say, I have made these decisions on your behalf? Has that been discussed? Um, it, it would be the executive decision. Exa exa exactly. exactly. Uh, if it's cross-cutting, controversial, significant, the normal rules of the executive are, are, are the operating principles. We do have to be mindful, though, that we've, we've got other committees and we've got ministerial autonomy and responsibilities. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they're starting out with a collective aim to get the best for the economy and the best for citizens and discussing issues in a very open manner. Um, and I, I couldn't say to you a minister is bound by certain... Um, to, to come back to the subcommittee on certain issues. It would depend. Is that within the remit of, of, of the subcommittee? But what, what, what we can't do is um, prevent ministers doing their departmental business. That would that would be wrong. But equally, we've got to aim for that collective discussion and maximum collective agreement around the executive table. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's. I think yeah. There, there will be individual individual decisions and collective decisions. But it seems that there could be a lot of different and at times conflicting decisions, which may not necessarily 
be being taken with the full endorsement of so, everybody across Northern Ireland. So that, that could lead to some interesting discussions further down the line. Good. Um, then moving away from that, then uh, has a schedule for um, initial engagement with stakeholders and other devolved administrations and looking at the north, south and the east, west bodies being, being drawn up by the subcommittee. Have they set out their views as to how they're going to engage with other people and so places? There, there are quite a few strands of engagement happening. There, there isn't, as, as we speak, uh, a sort of formal forward look on, on those dimensions. Uh, what we have is very regular uh, engagement with the other devolved administrations and the UK government. There, there are now a lot of regular quadrilateral conversations, a lot on an official level. Uh, the JMCEN is the main vehicle mm -hmm. for that, and uh, First Minister and Deputy First Minister went to that in, in Cardiff in January. There's, that, that will need to engage more fully as the negotiations unfold. Uh, it, it's fair to say, um, if you've seen some of the comments from, for example, the Scottish Brexit Minister, Mike Russell, um, in, the, in the Scottish Parliament last week, things aren't going all that smoothly. Um, is, that, is that reasonably f a bit of an understatement? Maybe? Um, th th there's a lot of tension between the uh, UK government and the other, other administrations. Yeah. We saw this as officials uh, in, in the last three years where the Scottish and Welsh ministers were wanting better access more advanced site of proposals. So there's a process there that it, it needs, to be, needs to be improved. In terms of north-south, uh, obviously there's a hiatus at the present time, but there have been very, very good north-south working relationships between officials in the last number of years. And of course, as NSMC comes back into, into uh, full operation, uh, once there's a, a new government in, in the south, then that will, that will be a very important stage. And indeed, NSMC has given some formal roles within the protocol. This, this is a, a very formal and distinct and important dimension to our work uh, with with um, with colleagues in Dublin on on that process. Okay, um, vice chair. Chair, thank you very much, and, and thank you both for your your words so far. Um, first of all, I, I want to talk about what happens to the powers and the policies that are repatriated from Brussels to Westminster, whether they remain at Westminster to become UK-wide policies or whether they are devolved for policies designed in Belfast, Cardiff uh, and Edinburgh, and specifically fisheries. What happens when we come out of the common fisheries policy? So uh, let me t I'll, I'll deal with the, the general issue and give Karen some time to think about the specific example. Um, but uh, the, the uh, general, this was dealt with in one of the important clauses within the earlier piece of legislation, the um, I've forgotten the formal title, but the Withdrawal Act uh, from 2018, uh, where the UK government took a power to, if if it so judged, and this was this was the breach of the Seoul Convention that caused great objections in Edinburgh and Cardiff. They insisted on taking a power that, if they so judged it necessary, then they could retain a repatriated power and insist that it operate at UK level. Uh, the position of, of Edinburgh and Cardiff on that issue was to say, no, that's not right. Uh, if, if something is under well-established practice, and indeed on the, the, the Scottish and Welsh devolution settlements, actually a devolved matter, and that would include issues such as agriculture, state aid, then it should automatically come to them or only be dealt with on a UK-wide basis if all four administrations agreed that was the right thing to do. So that, that's... Um, a, a, a matter of the balance of power between uh, London and now the, the three devolved administrations. Are, 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 because we've had a lot to do on the protocol and so on, we haven't actually had any specific uh, discussion with ministers on, on this issue, but although it is a very, a very significant one looking forward. There is an argument in some cases for uh, some repatriated powers to continue to operate consistently across the UK uh, that could be argued, for example, I'm not saying this is our position, it's, it's just a, a theoretical argument on state aid, for example, that if you're, if you're doing trade deals with third countries, then you're able to say our state aid rules are the same across the UK. That, that could be argued. Otherwise, you're into saying to the, to the third country, actually, in, in Scotland it's this, and in Wales it's that, and in Northern Ireland it's, that, it's the other. No, you know, both are possible. Hmm. Uh, it's a, it is a political judgment as to which is better, and that is is to be done case by case. 
um, on, on fisheries. I, I'm not sure of the precise facts. Do no, I, I think we'd, we'd have to write, if that's on, okay, Mr Nesbitt, on that particular question. But I think fisheries is going to be one yeah. of the, the big negotiating dynamics. The UK and the EU are going to start in very different places on that subject. That's interesting because on, on the 3rd of February, the uh, dear Minister Edmund Poots uh, told the Chamber in response to a question that I put to him, the policies on fishing and on what takes place on the waters will be set by the devolved administrations. It sounds like that is an inaccurate statement by the Minister. Well, well, I'm sorry, uh, 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 we're, we're saying we don't know if he's given an authority statement, he presumably knew. you. So, uh, but does he have the authority? Does he have the, the virus? Um, well, he's, a, he's the Minister for Agriculture, and yeah. so yes, fundamentally, and, and uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm not questioning either his briefing or, or what he said at all. So we could have a position then where you have the Irish fleet in the Irish Sea uh, under the Common Fisheries Policy, an English fleet under an English policy, a Scottish fleet under a Scottish policy, and a Northern Irish fleet under a Northern Ireland policy. Four policies, four fleets, one sea. Well, sorry, there is definitely a negotiation to be had on a fisheries agreement. That's that's part of what is coming uh, in terms of the negotiation process between the UK and the EU is to settle, to, to look look for. I think think this is, is is part of what was trailed in the Prime Minister's Greenwich speech. There'll be a, a series of agreements, and one that they would want to, want to secure uh, would be a fisheries agreement, and that would then. Uh, would be something because that's an, an international agreement on behalf of the UK that would determine how this works out. Uh, if that includes, as Minister Brutz has said, uh, an element of, of discretion or fuller discretion for the devolved administrations, that would have to be pinned down. So, what those different fleets could do would be defined in some way in an over overarching agreement. Okay, but he's not saying an element. He's saying full. Well, uh, as uh, we're, we're not, we're not the experts on fisheries. Let, let, let's move on to to the Home Office. Last we published the, the points-based immigration policy. Okay, and um, a salary threshold of 25,600 for low skills. Uh, and we heard Hospitality Ulster, we heard uh, the Retail Federation on behalf of the large shops saying this doesn't suit. We can assume that the agri food business and the fishery fleet uh, are, not, are not very happy. The, the immigration points based system was, was based on a report from the MAC, the Migration Advisory Committee, published in January of this year. They acknowledged regional variations in the cost of living, but they weren't prepared to recommend a variation in that minimum wage. Is that a failure on our part to persuade them? So, uh, going back to my time in the Department of the Economy, we've been consistently making representations as officials, and uh, ministers will continue to make representations. That that's uh, the the and we've, we we had meetings with Alan Manning and, and his and his team. Uh, the the political judgment. This is a, this is a um, accepted matter, a reserved matter. It's certainly not a devolved matter. It certainly isn't a devolved matter. So all that is possible for a devolved administration to do is to make representations, and representations were made, and both by us as officials and by uh, Hospitality Ulster, the, the range of business interests. It's a matter of grave concern. I think there'll still be further uh, argument and representation to be made by ministers on this issue because they, they, you know, the. the, the Ministers are not happy with what. Sorry, no. All ministers are not at all happy with what's been decided. It is a very major, uh, major problem. But it, the Mac report makes clear that there were representations yes. from all sorts of bodies within Northern Ireland, and they say they do acknowledge that there are regional variations. Uh, if you need twenty-five thousand six hundred to live in London, you don't need twenty-five thousand six hundred to survive in Northern Ireland, and yet they weren't prepared to give a regional variation on that twenty-five point six k. It does sound to me like a failure to persuade. Uh, it's a, a judgment that's been reached at a higher level with, with, by, by a government which has the authority to make that decision. Right. It's a real politic. There's another issue, I believe, which, which is not with low skilled but with skilled jobs. Um, and this refers to uh, the shortage occupation list, so called. In other words, jobs that have skills where we think we do not have enough suitably qualified people and therefore we ask for an exemption. There's a UK-wide list of SOLs, of shortage occupations. Yes. Scotland has its own list. We do not. But the MAC, in May 19, suggested that Wales and Northern Ireland should establish their own shortage occupation list. Why have we not done that? Um, 
Do have any more to say on that? Uh, so, again, uh, uh, that, that's something that uh, ultimately would involve an element of political judgment. So we, we, we have uh, a situation... Why, why would it involve political judgment? Sorry, it, 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 because the, the, this, is, this is what administration is all about, is that, is that important decisions have to be taken at a, at a political level. So uh, I think that there certainly was, was major representations made. We, we did our best as officials to make the points across to MAC and to the Home Office as the actual uh, Office of State mm -hmm. that would make these decisions. Um, but uh, again, this is uh, an area that, that the Department of the Economy would have a fuller and more detailed brief on this on this subject. That this is not a policy area that we've been dealing with in Executive Office uh, in the in the last uh, number of months. No, but but Andrew, on page 148 of, of this document that was published in January of this year, hmm. they're very clear. In May 2019, we recommended separate souls should be established for Wales and Northern Ireland. Were you aware of that? Um, that's not our, our area of, uh, of direct responsibility. Uh, we're, who's, we're aware, who's area it's is it? The economy. Economy. Well, I have a question then to the Department of Economy, a written question. I haven't had a response yet. But I think it is fair to say that ministers share all the concerns you've just mm. mentioned, Mr Nesbitt, about the impact on industries, but they are concerned about it. And yes, I, absolutely. I, and they don't absolutely, think yes. it's necessarily the end of the matter and they intend to make further representations. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what the Department of Economy have to say about that, but I think it's because th this is an opportunity uh, to, to dive down onto the 25.6k salary. Uh, so it's an yes, opportunity right. for our economy, and these are these are skilled jobs. Mm -hmm. Some of them in health. We need these jobs. These are potentially life-saving jobs. I completely agree. Uh, yes. We completely agree. And, and here we are, nearly in March of 2020, and this recommendation was in May 19. But as you say, it may be rest with another department. Could I, Twentieth of Mike, just, I just want to give you some... I, I serve on the Economy Committee, and the Minister, uh, in her first appearance before the Economy Committee, raised those issues that you have raised, and specifically mentioned about the salary bar, and how Northern Ireland, obviously, with our circumstances, that salary bar should perhaps reduced. So. And I, did you make a commitment to know that on a specific shortage no, occupation? Shouldn't. Sorry, can I just call a bit of order here? Everything's through the chair. Can I just remind you that we haven't yeah. devolved down into a very fair conversation, ne so continue ne on, please. Ne Let me finish, Chair. On the 20th of January, the Assembly de declined to give consent to the UK Government uh, to legislate on our behalf in terms of the relevant parts of the, with of the with Withdrawal Act. Um, we have potentially a border down uh, the Irish Sea. And yet, the aim, Andrew, of your department, I think, within the Executive Office is, and I quote from last week's briefing paper, the Executive Office aims to ensure that the UK Government's negotiating strategy for leaving the EU is aware of and informed by a full understanding of the Northern Ireland issues and implications at every stage. Yes. Given that, there's a border down the Irish Sea, that we didn't give uh, our consent and all the other issues I've raised, would you accept that, that your aim has been a catastrophic failure to date? Um, I think some of the decisions uh, in relation to the withdrawal agreement would be substantially above my pay grade. So this is, this is uh, the, the, the outcome in October followed on from two and a half years of intensive negotiations on uh, addressing the really difficult issue of the land, land border between this part of Ireland and the south. That's, that's, that was a, a, a point of contention through the entire Theresa May administration. And you saw the backstop, first of all, proposal for Northern Ireland only backstop, then the UK-wide backstop that was built into her agreement, which then did not, uh, it was catastrophically rejected by the House of Commons on, on several occasions. The, 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 then there was a further negotiation in which there was no Northern Ireland voice at all in October as to what would be done instead. That's what happened. Uh, and it, the UK government came to an agreement uh, with, where the, um, with the European Commission and, and then the member states had signed off at the European Council in October that created the protocol that is seen as a compromise. It, it avoids all that would be actually difficult, both politically and, and practically, to deal with in relation to the issues in the land border. Uh, it, it retains and protects the single market. If there are successful outcomes 
to the negotiations that are forthcoming on the uh, application and implementation of the protocol such that our trade is protected in various ways, then there is still the possibility of there being a successful outcome for Northern Ireland. And that's the responsibility that we have now, and which ministers have now, is to say, given what's been settled, given what has been reached after many, many permutations and much examination of possibilities, this was an incredibly <coughs> difficult set of negotiations. And you could, you could argue it's what brought uh, the make of went down. Uh, that's where we are. And you know, that, we can't change that. The Assembly can't change that. It, it is what it is. Uh, that's, that's a consequence of a much larger scale negotiation. Let, let me finish then, Chair, by putting it another way. Would you accept that the UK Government's negotiating strategy, while it may have been aware of uh, a full understanding of our issues, that strategy was not informed? Uh, it, oh, there was no shortage of information, there was no shortage of understanding. No, but uh, informed it, it means you, you shape your strategy. Well, uh, what, they it, what, didn't shape the what it doesn't necessarily mean is that the considerations arising from that set of information overrides what was the very determined <coughs> approach taken by the Johnson government that the UK would leave the single market and the customs union. That, that's, that, he, his, his, his colours are nailed to that mast very, very firmly, very, very clearly, uh, as you've seen in his Greenwich speech, uh, as you see in the David Frost speech in Brussels. They are saying... Uh, we do not apologise for friction. We do not apologise for autonomy. This is what independence means. We're going to be a separate country. If you have an open land border, then there are goods moving freely across that land border. And there is no practical or politically acceptable way to change that, anything on, on that nature. Then the European, European Council, the Member States and the Commission insisted that the single market be protected. And the UK Government agreed that. That's what happened in October. The protocol is the best they could do to de deliver that. It's absolutely, absolutely definitely informed by good understanding of this, this region's interests. And, and attempts have been made uh, from, from the Commission and the UK Government to find ways to make it as, as um, beneficial as possible. There are still enormous challenges that need to be addressed, um, but uh, and it, it certainly does not involve uh, Northern Ireland being, being subject to the full obligations of, of EU membership. There are some key elements of European legislation affecting goods, affecting regulatory regimes. Those are required because the single market has to be retained. That's, that's the way it is. Uh, that's uh, the settlement they reached. Uh, that's the best compromise that they could find in their judgment as UK government. Uh, it's now up to us. Uh, to work out the practicalities to secure the best possible implementation of that protocol in a way that, that serves our interests. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Emma. Thank you, Chair, and thank you both for your presentation. So, I mean, I think every point that's been raised thus far would prove my belief that the British government doesn't really care about the north of Ireland and, and their attitude has demonstrated that. I've got a couple of questions. Just, uh, I touched earlier on a, on a specific issue with, with Shauna. Mm -hmm. We have um, a, a firm uh, near where I'm from, we're involved in parallel importation. Mm -hmm. And you've touched there on the companies that are dealing with goods that would be deemed at risk. And there's not a lot of clarification as to what the arrangements will be post the end of this year. The, the company that I'm talking about import goods from other EU states, mm -hmm. repackage them in their base in the north here, and then export them to Dublin. Mm -hmm. So it was Shauna's just right. initial belief, and it was their understanding and my understanding that they wouldn't fall into that at risk. Sounds but they haven't got clarification on that, and no one can seem to give them clarification. So they're, they're left in this limbo where they can't okay. prepare. So if the components or whatever that they're that are part of their supply chain are coming from within the EU then then there's no impediment the, the land border is open and that that means that there's no um, that they're not they're not covered by the relevant terms of the protocol the protocol is dealing with article 5 of the protocol deals with the movement of goods from GB to NI so if the, if the component if on the other hand the uh, supply chain that's relevant to their, their activities is in 
England, Scotland or Wales, then the, if their market is in the EU, then that's by definition at risk. So they, they would almost certainly be caught if the components are coming from across the water. If, they're, if the components are coming from either from or through the south, then Article 5 of the protocol doesn't apply. So there, there, would, there, there, wouldn't, there wouldn't be, there shouldn't be any, any risk. change to their right. business model. Right. So, so I mean, the, the, the reality here is that, is that uh, the debate f settled after many swings of the pendulum in a way that leaves the, the, the land border and um, the north-south supply chains open and, and working. There are, there are potential issues in relation to uh, the association of goods and services. So the, the protocol does not, not deal with services. Uh, that's a, a matter for future negotiation in the FTA negotiations between the UK and the EU. And that, that's, a, that's a lot of really important stuff for us to address in that context, um, both to ensure that we get the benefit of um, that FTA in relation to uh, service, service provision that is, is being traded in the rest of the UK and, and, and the, in the rest of the world, um, but also that with it, the very close integration of many ser services firms, north and south, that's also protected. So there's a, a lot of detail to work out. But from the case you describe, I, 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 I think that sounds okay to me. Okay. What you've said. Right. No, that's 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 helpful. They haven't had clarification from from any other body. Just in terms then of the of the briefing note or the the overview that you had provided. Um, You've stated quite explicitly on page five that uh, the British government had written in October 2019 indicating that they intend to provide an opportunity for devolved administrations to contribute to draft future partnership negotiating parameters in devolved areas subject to discussions with incoming ministers about their role and then that this commitment does not take account of devolved interests in the <coughs> matters. You then make reference to the JMC meeting in, um, at the end of January. Is there any further clarification on on this so um that's a very, very live topic indeed okay. this week uh, so um the there have been a range of discussions involving um the uk government and the other devolved administrations as the uk moves towards the completion of its mandate for negotiations its initial statement of its objectives they've been stated in uh, in speech form so far, at, in the Greenwich speech by the Prime Minister, uh, there's a more detail required, and, and that's that's been part of our engagement. Uh, again, um, the, the safe space for me in answering your question is to draw attention to what Mike Russell said in the Scottish Parliament next week, or sorry, last week. Uh, <laughs> well, that, that, that's, it, it'll be the same again. So, <laughs> so I was right the first time as well. Uh, but um, that, the, he said very strongly that the Devolved, authority, uh, devolved administrations have not been respected yes. fully, uh, well, hardly at all, to be honest, in the dealings they've had with the UK government in preparing the mandate. Terms of reference of JMCEN uh, say that that body exists to provide a forum for, uh, for the negotiating mandates to be discussed and, if possible, agreed. Uh, throughout the last three years, that never happened. Uh, I, I was the, no, Karen and I were, and, or David Sterling, the, the, one of the three of us was usually the representative uh, in the absence of ministers at those meetings. And the May administration never once brought to that meeting to say, here's what we think we'll do. That, that was never the case. I suspect because they were having quite a lot of difficulties within their own team. Their own. Uh, yeah, so that, that's what happened. And it, and it, it hasn't <coughs> actually got, in, got, well, it's a little bit better now, but not a lot better. Is that Chair, if just one better? more mm -hmm. week. So can, do, you, do you believe that the, the Office First and Deputy First Minister is going to be involved in the phase two negotiations? Um, the, uh, the undertaking is yes. Uh, we, we, at, at Cardiff, there was a discussion of, of modes and means by which uh, there would be political engagement uh, between the UK government and the three devolved administrations in the preparation of the, of the negotiations. And what we expect as a minimum to happen is that as the negotiations proceed and they're coming towards a crunchy, a crunchy decision to be taken, they say, what is your opinion on this point? And that, that if there's any respect in terms of the way the process should work, they should be giving that to 
to the devolved administrations in time for there to be a discussion, for there to be a discussion at executive level, for there to be consideration and analysis and advice on the regional interest in that issue. That's what, to me, should happen. That would be a good process. I don't hold my breath okay, on that point. Okay, thank you very much. We have a, no a number of other members that have indicated that they wish to, to speak and we're already over time. So if I could ask members and if I could ask our, our guests as well, okay. if we could just consider maybe shortening uh, questions and answers just so that we can proceed. But I'll pass on now to Pat. Thanks, Chair. Uh, and thanks, Andrew. And just moving on from the point that Emma was making there, uh, just for clarity, uh, are you saying that uh, the First and Deputy First Minister won't have direct access to the negotiations. They won't have direct access to the British or the EU negotiators. Um, they should be they, they should be able to meet with and influence the UK negotiators before they in turn go into the negotiation room. Um, we are also always able to have informal discussions with the other side. But I, I use that term because they are the other side, and uh, it, is, it is up to the UK to propose and then bring back settlements. But uh, both with Brussels and our, our good contacts in the European Commission, uh, Michel Barnier was here uh, last month. Uh, he said his doors open to us. We've always had the chance to meet the task force. Uh, we have good relationships with colleagues in Dublin, uh, who are also, of course technically on the other side of the, of the debate, in that sense, uh, as, a, as a member state. Uh, so uh, we have to be careful on these things, but there sh that we don't have direct access. I, I doubt if uh, a Northern Ireland representative would ever get into the negotiation room as such. Well, that's the point I wanted, to, wanted clarity on. <coughs> so in, in terms of our priorities are, for example, the avoidance of trade barriers, the protection of the Good Friday Agreement and all its parts, uh, the implementation of the Irish Protocol, um, uh, the efforts to keep down costs in terms of West East trading, you know, so that prices aren't going up on Asda and Tesco and so on. So, uh, all of those issues that are important to us were dependent on uh, the British government negotiating those on our behalf. Just briefly, I would distinguish between the uh, discussions on, on the trade uh, agreement, which will in turn affect how the protocol is applied, they would be effectively exclusive to the UK government, as, as, as in that, that answer. Uh, I said earlier that there's a, a degree of access to the discussions on the protocol, including attendance at some meetings with the Commission on the protocol. But that's on the limited range of issues that are for decision by the Joint Committee. Um, so there's an awful lot that is, is not, and that's where, again, we have to see what we can do in terms of engaging with London and Brussels on those issues. And just in terms of the Good Friday Agreement and mm -hmm. protection for it and all its parts, Richie Neil, who chairs the Ways and Means Committee on Capitol Hill, and Nancy Pelosi have both said that if the Good Friday Agreement isn't protected during mm -hmm. discussions that uh, there won't be any trade deal between the UK and the US. So, uh, I presume yes. the British negotiators are aware of that. I'm sure they're well aware of that fact. And uh, we've, we've, again, through the office in Washington, we, we know and uh, work with uh, Richie Neal's team and so on. It's, it's a good, as, as a friend of Ireland. Okay. And just one final question, uh, following on from what the discussion Mike was having with you around the, uh, the immigration point system. Has any assessment been carried out here on how that uh, the implementation of that uh, system will affect the economy here? Uh, well, yes, I, I think the Department of the Economy have done so. detailed work in that area, but I, I wouldn't. I think we need to check and come back yeah. to you on that. Okay. But, but it's it's bound to be part of their evidence to uh, to the Mac. Fair enough. Thank you, okay. uh, Fran. The problem we're coming in forth is that there's <laughs> very, very little left to, to hang, but what I would like to emphasize is one of the questions that you had raised, and the importance of the flow of information. I think we have obviously a responsibility for scrutinizing uh, the, the Office of the Executive. 
and uh, the, 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 the flow of information allows us to uh, do our job properly, and we hope that that, that, uh, that will follow. That's, that's part of our commitment to you, is, is, and we have the forward look in terms of our attendance here. We want to make sure that we give the committee uh, all the information we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Trevor? Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks for your uh, words of wisdom so far. Um, all I'm hearing here, frankly, is uh, not for the first time the civil service doing its best to work with the hand that has been dealt, and um, political masters quite frequently putting their foot on it, making promises that they can't keep, and money in the water, then down red lines that they can't be maintained. That applies to the Prime Minister, to the Secretary of State, I think it also, my mic has referred to it, when we're getting the benefit of the Assembly as well. And all that points towards me, that this, this, this timetable, this deadline we have, this can't be kept. And if we're being realistic about it, and I'm coming to my question now, uh, we need to be making all the preparations we can for, for no deal, and the inevitability of WTO regulation coming in. So I suppose the question would be, what, what, what input will we have into the situation if there is no deal? And uh, what, what would be the effect of moving to WTO rules, perhaps for a number of years? That's the way it looks to me. So my take on that would be that, that what, what is the risk at the, at the end of this calendar year is a, a, the absence of a trade deal with the EU. Mm -hmm. uh, the withdrawal agreement would still apply, so the protocol would be in place. And that is of some help. It, it, it's, there are really serious issues in relation to the protocol, but on the other hand, it does underpin some things that would be unique to, to here and not available to the rest of the UK, including uh, access to the EU market because the land border is open. Uh, so selling stuff into the EU w without any tariffs or te uh, no bar barriers to trade, that, that's possible. Uh, that wouldn't apply to elsewhere. So there, there, we're, we, we would have a lot to do, though. There would be ma very major issues, and we would need to do a major planning exercise, a contingency planning exercise, to cope with the consequences. It would not, it's nothing like as serious as the contrast between EU membership and a no-deal exit, as, as was the risk either at March of last year or October of last year, where we were in, in a really focused contingency planning mode. Could I just interject one thing, because okay. you, you said there that uh, that the protocol would still apply and yes. to the effect that we would still be able to trade openly with Europe on a non-tariff basis. Yep. But, but, but <coughs> you know, we, we left as one nation and all the rest of it. <laughs> would, the, would the UK stand for that? Well, or, or would, would the, Europe stand for it? Well, b both have accepted that. It's, it's, that's what the protocol says. I mean, that would be a, a huge relief to our, our businesses here. It's, it, it's, it, it, there's something good about that. It's still got some complications, and the a no-deal scenario makes the application and implementation of the protocol more difficult. Yes. A, a, a zero-tariff, zero-quota free trade agreement, as if that's what the Johnson government was to achieve by the end of this year, would make the protocol easier to apply. There still would be complications and still lots to deal with. but. Um, it, at least it's still there in, in terms of, of it creates a floor uh, under the risks we face, which doesn't apply uh, elsewhere in the UK. We're in your hands. Uh, not just mine, thank goodness. OK, um, Andrew and Karen, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Um, I suppose we're somewhat clearer and probably clearer about the complexities that we have to try and understand, but I'm sure uh, we'll be seeing you on a regular basis and uh, we'll have more questions and more in-depth understanding the next no. time we meet. But thank you very much indeed for coming along today. Thank you. And as we change over at the table there then, uh, members, i uh, just refer you to page item 6 on page 28 of the meeting pack, which is references to the functioning of government miscellaneous provisions bill. And that bill is uh, sponsored by Mr. Jim Allister, MLA, who has joined us this afternoon uh, as he makes his way around the various committees that have ping-ponged discussions on this um, bill. Uh, maybe just before uh, you give us an update on 
the, um, the policy objectives and clauses of the bill. I could update members that as chair of the committee, um, I met with other chairs of other relevant committees um, to have a discussion with the, uh, com the committee clerk about how um, which committee would be best placed to take this forward. Um, so, um, oh, I've probably been told I should leave this to after. Should have been over there now. Um, that under Standing Order 64A, the chairperson of the Finance Committee agreed that the Committee of Finance will carry out the committee stage of the bill. Um, but it should be noted that this committee will also need to take evidence on the relevant clauses and report any of the findings back to the lead committee. So there will still be work for ourselves to do because quite a number of the clauses that were assessed by the committee clerks do have direct responsibility on the executive office and therefore fall uh, to the competencies of this committee. But um, that will be for us to, to progress later in the term. So, uh, Mr. Alistair, I'll pass over to yourself to, to give us a short input on the, the bill. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, well, for me, the catalyst for the wanting to bring this bill was the evidence that was being reported from the RHI inquiry. Um, I believe that much of that evidence affronted many people in the general public and raised an expectation that things would be mended and action should be taken. And um, from my percep perception, this bill really, it has three strands to it. Uh, clauses f 6 to 11 um, directly address some issues which can be tracked right to the RHI inquiry, uh, matters such as not keeping records of meetings, contacts, um, meetings without civil servants, use of unofficial devices, um, registers of interest offence, uh, unlawful dis or unauthorised disclosure of information. So those issues, and I'll happily discuss each clause in due course if required, uh, are reflected essentially in clauses 6 to 11. Uh, clauses 1 to 5 focus on changes to the existing law and um, they address issues as to, for example, the number of special advisors. Um, it seems quite shocking to me that uh, the Office of the First and Deputy First Minister have the same number of special advisors as the entire Welsh Government or can have. I think recently they've only appointed six, but they've an entitlement to appoint eight. Uh, that our special advisors were running at a cost of twice that of Scotland and twice that of Wales. And um, therefore, uh, I thought it would be appropriate uh, to seek to reduce the number of special advisors in that office. Uh, I'm suggesting four, um, and I think they've presently appointed six. There's two ways of doing that. Um, the historic arrangement was that the First Minister had three, the Deputy First Minister had three, and that was it. Then in 2007, a provision was brought in to allow each junior minister to have a special advisor, making a total of eight. Um, so if, from my perspective, you want to reduce that to four, there's two ways of doing that. Either take away the junior minister's special advisors and take one off the First Minister and one off the, special, off the uh, Deputy. Uh, or the other way of doing it was simply reduce the first and deputy first minister from three to one, and then you have the deputies uh, or the juniors, and that creates four. Um, so that's that's the mechanism chosen in, in clause two. Uh, the bill also seeks, again, a reflection of some of the evidence from RHI, it seeks to stop a hierarchy of special advisors seeking to control across the departments. There was some evidence about that, other than within the executive office. I think that's obviously understandable. Uh, and since uh, special advisors are temporary civil servants, subject to all the benefits and privileges of the civil service, uh, it seems to me in Congress that they're not subject to the disciplinary processes of the civil service. So Clause 1, 3 would seek to do that. Um, and uh, Clause 1, 6, would seek to thwart 
the efforts that were made following the 2013 Act, which removed serious people with serious criminal convictions from the position of SPADs, the attempt that was made to circumvent that by putting party officials to act in Stormont Castle as if they were special advisors uh, with access to everything that goes with it. And so Clause 1 6 would seek to impose a duty on the Permanent Secretary to make sure that the cooperation, recognition, and facilitation that's due to a special advisor wouldn't be allowed to anyone else. I think that's appropriate. Um, clause uh, 3 arises from a very specific situation. Uh, members will recall that at the time when David Gordon was appointed, that appointment was possible because uh, secretly and unknown to the Assembly, uh, the 1999 order of the um, uh, was amended by prerogative powers of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister purporting to exercise prerogative powers to change the law. Uh, so I want to reverse that and to make those powers only exercisable, uh, any such change only exercisable by affirmative resolution. So as the law can't be changed behind the backs of the Assembly and that the Assembly would have to approve any change in the law, and that's Clause 3. Uh, clause 4 is a natural follow-through. If there's going to be a reduction, then there has to be compensation uh, at the begin point. Clause 5 uh, uh, makes the suggestion that the um, breaches of the Ministerial Code should be able to be considered by the Standards Commissioner, because effectively today there isn't an adequate uh, complaints or investigation process for against uh, ministers for breach of the ministerial code. And this simply seeks to use the quite straightforward device of extending the powers of the Standards Commissioner to cover not just MLAs, but to cover ministers. And therefore to look not just at the code of MLAs, but the code of uh, the ministerial code. And that, of course, is totally in keeping with the very last resolution that the Assembly passed before it collapsed in 2017. Because the last motion passed in this House in January 17 was to extend the powers of the Assembly Standards Commissioner uh, to include ministers. Uh, now, new decade, new approach uh, has something to say about this. To me, it seems a bit like reinventing the wheel. It's very elaborate. It's about appointing new commissioners, etc., etc. But the real problem with it, as I see it, is at the end of the day, uh, even though we appoint additional commissioners to examine alleged breaches of ministerial code, they can't recommend any sanction, and there can be no sanction. It's all in the gift of the um, First Minister, the Deputy First Minister, whoever. Um, so that doesn't seem to me to be very, a very good way to do business. and. Um, nor to meet the expectations of the public that there will be accountability. Because I think out there, this Assembly isn't in great standing, and I think there is an expectation that action will be taken to improve matters. And uh, I think those are the sort of issues you need to look at. The third aspect of the bill that uh, I draw your attention to is Clause 12. I just don't want this to be a bill that when it's passed, that's it. I want to create a process of rolling review. So Clause 12, I think, is quite important. It creates a situation where every two years, the um, first and Deputy First Minister will bring a report to the Assembly on uh, the functioning of government, having looked at judicial review criticisms in the last two years, having looked at what other commissioners, etc., for these things have to say, and they would report on where improvements can be further made in the function of government. So I think that's an important thing going forward, that we don't just pass a piece of legislation and park it and forget about it. We activate a process. Um, so that's a very quick overview of the, um, of the bill. Um, and it's probably more useful if I simply deal with whatever questions you have. Okay, um, Mr. Ross, thank you very much indeed for giving us that um, quick introduction to the bill. We will open uh, uh, for discussion three questions, and I'll uh, commence with that. I suppose uh, it is important to 
I acknowledge and note that the appointment and the terms, conditions and powers of SPADS has um, lost the faith of the public. I think that's a fair point that you make. Um, I think through the resetting of the Assembly and the Executive uh, through the uh, new decade, new approach, I think there is an expectation within the public that there will be some of the, the bad practices of the past uh, will be um, changed. I think that all parties uh, acknowledge that and there was quite constructive work done through the openness and transparency strand of the talks last um, summer and the contributions that that made to the relevant sections in the NDNA uh, document and I think that <coughs> a review of the practice of and powers of SPADS is certainly necessary and given the backdrop of coming back is certainly timely. Just on a, a few questions then um, that I would have specifically, um, there was a suggestion within uh, your uh, bill that there wasn't the need to reconsult on the basis that um, there was already previous uh, consultations carried out. So I suppose maybe just um, in terms of um, the previous consultations, did they definitely cover all of the clauses that are contained within the bill that you've presented? And given that the RHI report hasn't been yet published, how confident are you that the proposals that you're making will address the issues that might be raised through there? Yep. Well, a, a couple of very relevant points there. Um, clauses one to four, not entirely, but substantially, reflect what was in a bill that I brought before the House in 2015, which didn't get past second stage, but in the bringing of that bill about the reduction in the number of SPADs, about putting them under a disciplinary code, etc., I had conducted a public consultation, uh, which was reported at the time. Um, the other clauses essentially arising out of what's been unfolding in RHI have not been subjected to a formal public consultation. Two reasons for that. One, it seems to me self-evident that the public are appalled at what has been happening and there's an appetite for change. Uh, secondly, um, when you bring a private member's bill, there's two ways to do it. Uh, the first and probably the most normal way is to go to the bill's office and say, I've got an idea, I'd like to bring legislation about it, and they formulate it and you then are obligated to formally have a consultation process. The other way of bringing a private member's bill is not to use the bill's office at all, to draft it yourself and to simply present it to the Speaker's office and provided it's, it's uh, legislatively competent, then it uh, moves forward. And in those circumstances, there's no obligation for formal consultation. That's the route I took. I drafted this bill myself, presented it to the Speaker's office, etc. So, uh, but primarily because I've already consulted on some of it, and the second part of it, I think, is self-evidently crying out for need and is in tune, I believe, what the public expectation is. But that's why there's been no formal consultation. Okay. Um, you're proposing uh, reducing the number of um, SPADs within the Executive Office from eight to four. Yes. Um, have you taken any views on the impact that that might have within the Department in terms of the workload that the Department does and the impact that there would be of reducing? Well, that was four. sorry. That was part of what I consulted in back in fifteen, uh, and the, the response to that was positive. But uh, you know, when we look at it and discover that the last published figures for Northern Ireland SPADs was a cost of over £2 million uh, for the number that we had. And then you look at uh, corresponding years for Scotland and discover it was just over £1 million. And in Wales, it was just over, just under £1 million. And you look at Wales and see they have a totality of eight special advisors. And then you look back at our First Minister and Deputy First Minister's office, you discover they have eight. You know, it doesn't add up to me that the um, TEO needs the same number of special advisors as the whole Welsh Government. So I think there is an extravagance there. And it's interesting that to date, though they still have the capacity to appoint two more, they have only apparently appointed six. I think within that must be some recognition that it has been overdone at eight. 
uh, and that's why I'm suggesting four if, if the House, if the bill gets through consideration stage and the House thinks four is not the right number, a two would do, or six would do, uh, who knows, but uh, uh, it, it's all in the gift of the House. I would entirely expect if the rules were reversed that you would say this to me. That was a great answer, but it didn't answer my question. Have, you, have you taken views on what the impact of the reduction would be as opposed to just benchmarking it against other other jurisdictions? I, I haven't taken views, if you mean have I gone and discussed it with with the uh, vested interests of the, of the executive office. No, I haven't. I, I've approached it from the basis that the thing speaks for itself, okay. that if Wales can do with eight in total, what on earth are we doing with eight in one office? Finally, just um, in terms of a couple of the items, a couple of the clauses that you have, the, the penalties are criminal, yes. um, even imprisonment. Um, yes. It seems somewhat harsh for, for, for people carrying out their, their, their work and if it was done incorrectly. Just has that been benchmarked again against other um, jurisdictions and other um, devolved areas in terms of the guidelines that those um, individual SPADs would follow over there? Did, did there a code of conduct that they have no. entailed sort of no. criminal... No, it hasn't. It's tailored very much to what I perceive to be the need emerging from the RHI inquiry. And some of the most scandalous things in the RHI was the deliberate hiding of information through the deployment of private uh, electronic means. Uh, so uh, I think that that needs to be addressed in such a way as to create a significant deterrent against it. Uh, an even more shocking revelation probably in the RHI evidence was uh, of a SPAD uh, distributing confidential information to family and friends. And now, that seems to me to require a <clears throat> statutory deterrent. And I say that for this reason, that the old code already prohibited that. The old code, in fact, said a, at paragraph 12, at paragraph uh, 5 of Schedule 2, that SPADs had to conduct themselves with integrity and honesty. Uh, they should not disclose confidential information. And though it was in a code, it still happened, which causes me to conclude that a code is not enough. Now, uh, and it also, in fact, was in the terms and conditions of former special advisors. Paragraph 24 of the old code uh, imposed a confidentiality clause. didn't stop it. So... If it's an issue, if it's a mischief and it needs to be addressed and addressing it through a code hasn't done it, hasn't delivered the product, then the next step is to address it through legislation. And it doesn't seem to me unreasonable that if someone in the terms of Clause 11 for advantage to others or themselves just takes, uh, exploits their own office, takes the confidential information they have and distributes it to others for their advantage, why should that not be a criminal offence? Now, special advisors are already subject to the Official Secrets Act, but the Official Secrets Act really takes care of high-level matters, national security, etc. What is needed here is a specific deterrent of an offence, that if you distribute to your brother, your cousin, whoever, confidential information, then it's a criminal offence. Uh, and I think that would be a reasonable repost to some of the evidence we saw in RHI. And is it clear within your, um, the, the clauses of the bill that it would be specifically for something that breaks the, the rules in that way by providing for financial gain to each other? Because maybe my just reading of it is that it's if they used a, a personal email in any shape or form that they could be subject no, to... No, sorry, the, sorry, Joe, there's two offences. Yep. I'm presently talking about... Clause 11, the offence of unauthorised disclosure, yeah. and it's specifically for the financial or other benefit of any other person. But uh, in Clause, clause 9, it does suggest nine if somebody sends the an email, of official they system. forwarded an email incorrectly, but yes. their own email address, right. they could go to if, prison for two years. No, no, because Clause 9 two says it is an offence for a person charged with an offence under subsection 1 
to prove that the person had a reasonable excuse. Okay, so, so a reasonable excuse. And there, there's another thing about that. You can only be prosecuted for an offence if it's in the public interest. Okay. Um, two tests are sufficient of evidence to make a conviction likely and the prosecution being in the public interest. Now, it never would be in the public interest to prosecute someone for inadvertently using the wrong phone. But if someone uses the wrong, uses deliberately and consciously, avoids using the official systems in order to maintain, ensure there's no record of it as happened in RHI, then that should be a criminal offence. There can be no reasonable excuse for that. Now, it could be that a minister, special advisor, uh, there's an unforeseen eventuality, they're out and about somewhere, they don't have their official systems if that's hard to work with them, and they have to use their own device. Well, that's a reasonable excuse. No one's sending them to prison for that. But if they say, no, they're doing something they shouldn't be doing, and they do it on private channels and processes in order to not make it either FOIable or to make it ever discoverable, uh, then there should be a deterrent about that. And that's what Clause 9 is about. Thank you. Mike. Chair, thank you very much. And, uh, Chair, you're very welcome. Um, we have been told to expect the report of the Renewable Heat Incentive to be published on Friday the 13th of March, yes. uh, uh, which looks like it will be ahead of the second reading of this bill. Yes. That's the decision you've made? Yes. Why are you so confident that you can second guess a public comment? Well, I'm not confident at all. That's why. Well, then why not wait? Well, I am waiting till after his report. Uh, that's why I'm not asking for the second stage debate until we see what's in the report. And the reason for that is I deliberately drafted the long title in this bill to make it as wide as possible so that it can accommodate as wide a range of amendments as possible. Um, so the, the long title in this is about making any additional provisions for the functioning of government and connected purposes. So if Sir Pat Patrick Cochran comes up with multiple recommendations which require statutory provision, then here on the tracks ready to go is a bill to which can be added at members' desire multiple amendments because it's wide enough in ambit to accept amendments. So the alternative is to sit back, uh, having waited for however long it is to get the Cochrane report, and then ruminate on it for another six, eight, ten, twelve months before anyone does anything about it. Uh, whereas this is a bill which, yes, anticipates the need from the evidence, but does not prescribe that these are the only steps which can be taken. So it seems to me appropriate that we have a mechanism which can accommodate, if members wish it to accommodate, other things which Sir Patrick Cochrane throws up. You don't subscribe then to the view that if a private member brings forward a bill which has to be amended and amended and amended, that that reflects poorly on their judgment? No, I, I, I don't. Do. I, I think a bill which provides a framework capable of being improved is always a good thing. I don't think there's any bill that's ever been created that couldn't be improved. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think a bill which identifies uh, identifiable targets that need addressed, uh, if it doesn't foresee everything, but then the field of vision improves to show that there's something that needs addressed, or Mike Nesbitt thinks there's something that needs addressed, here's a vehicle, here's an opportunity to move an amendment to do it. And I think that's exactly how a legislative assembly should work, that you, you have a bill to which the House can then mold, can mould to its desire. I understand you've, you've offered to discuss your bill with the main political parties. How has that gone for you? I've had discussions with your own party. I've had discussions with the Alliance party. I've had a promise of discussions, but it hasn't yet happened with the SDLP. That's as far as it's gone. And at this stage, do you anticipate any amendments? Yes, uh, I anticipate some from myself. <laughs> because, for example, uh, I am minded to put into Clause 5, this is the one about the um, independent, uh, this is the one about the Standards Commissioner. Uh, I've been thinking of an amendment which would prohibit the use of of the petition of concern on any such report. 
because we had that in the past. Uh, and I'm sure there are many other amendments. I, in my discussions now this afternoon, uh, I probably have been persuaded from the Finance Committee from contributions of Matthew Toole and Paul Frew that Clause 11 probably should include the same lawful excuse defence that Clause 9 does, not least maybe to provide more of a cushion for whistleblowers. So yes, there are, there's room for much improvement, I'm sure. Final question, Jim. Um, one of your intents seems to be to tie the SPADs more closely to their ministers. But the Finance Minister, Conor Murphy, in, in amending the codes, yeah. has made clear that SPADs will be for the entire executive, not just for ministers. So there's a clear tension there, and I would like you to address well, that. Well, um, they are still the appointees of the individual minister. It is still the individual minister under the minister, under uh, Mr Murphy's code uh, which uh, has responsibility for ensuring they comply with this bad code, uh, who has responsibility such as it is for their discipline. So they are still individual, identified as individual SPADs specific to a particular department. Uh, I don't see anything in my bill which conflicts with their uh, generic duty to the whole executive. I don't think there's anything in my bill that conflicts with that. I'm simply asking that they live by they live by the legislation, that they are subject to adequate discipline, uh, and all of that can be within the ambit of them serving the executive as a whole as much as serving their individual minister. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just Trevor, you had on a supplement or to add on to that. If you want to take it, and then we'll move on. Yeah. Just, just following on from Mike's point, then. Yeah. Um, how would that work then if a member was working for a different minister and broke the code? How then can you tie the minister to that? Well, I don't think I don't think uh, the finance minister's I don't think the code of conduct as now is anticipates that it would be different compartments, as it were. That one day you're working for one minister and the next day you're working for another. I think you're you're always the the spad of the agriculture minister, say, uh, but you have to perform your duties with a view to the overall intent and purposes of the executive. So I don't think there's a there's a conflict there. Um, I, I, th I thought maybe taken from what? Sorry, to, I know you're dead. Can we come back to you and let you unpack the thoughts, and we'll go no, to Emma? Well, it's, 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 it's relevant, I see, what Mike has yeah, said. But it's also now a supplementary, just supplementary. Well, then I'll just leave I, it. If we, can, if we can't scrutinise it. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to you at the end and let you come in, because, just Emma, leave you're Thanks, there. There's chair. always in front of you. Jim, just following on from, from the question that Mike had asked you, yes. I thought it was interesting, the first uh, point that you made in reference to this bill was that it was formed and came uh -huh. out as a result of the RHA inquiry. Yes. Yet... We have yet to see the report. We've yet to see the recommendations of an yeah. independent inquiry. Yeah. Now, you've given a rationale in terms of the, the speediness or the length of time that it would yeah. take. Surely it would have been simpler to have those recommendations and then make an informed decision about what you want to have in your bill and well, go from there. Well, well, I think I was really tried to indicate. I don't see any conflict in that. It's quite clear to me that there are issues already in the public domain that need to be addressed like someone distributing material to family members. Now, we can't close our eyes to that. We don't need Sir Patrick Cochran to tell us that was wrong. Well, we don't need Sir Patrick Cochran to tell us that it's wrong to try and conceal uh, things on private devices. Those are things we, we, uh, we can act on. We don't need Sir Patrick Cochran to tell us that it's wrong not to keep a note of a meeting. So we can act in all those, uh, get ready to act in all those, but get ready with a vehicle which enables us to also swiftly deal with other issues. But you're still up. holding off acting on that until after the conclusion of the inquiry and the release of the report. Yes, well, I'm, so I'm, I'm holding, holding on. I'm holding let on. the independent inquiry run its course, have your report, see what is flagged up from that? Or, or you do this, which may be called by some awkwardness and political point scoring? No, I don't see it like that. Um, because but you can I'm see not asking... No, I'm not asking the Assembly to commit to anything. 
in advance of seeing Sir Patrick Cochrane's report, because the second stage bill uh, reading of this bill will not take place till after Sir Patrick Cochrane's report. So we will all come to the second stage debate well informed about what the Cochrane report says, and then we can benchmark this bill against it and see if it helps or if it hinders. Uh, so I don't see any contradiction. I could understand if I'd preempted and become forward and had this debate before Cochrane comes out. Of course, there would be a legitimate point to say, well, why are you preempting it? I'm not. I'm waiting to see what Cochrane says, and then I'm saying, here's a vehicle to help to deal with some of those things. Surely in the drafting of the bill, you're preempting it. No, I'm anticipating some of the things I've identified. That no matter what Sir Patrick says, it's wrong to distribute confidential information to your friends. No matter what he says, it's wrong to uh, hold meetings that you don't mean it so that they can never be FOI'd. Those things are so glaringly wrong. You don't need a report to tell us that. But when we get a report, we may see there's other things that need to be addressed as well. And I think, I think you know, in large measure, the do nothing school of thought may be an excuse for exactly that, do nothing. I don't think that's tenable. As to it being point scoring, well, it, let me be very clear. My view of these institutions would make it very simple for me to sit back and watch it wallow and do nothing. But I believe that we can't go on as things are. We need to bring some order where there's disorder. We need to address these issues. And, you know, that's my motivation in this. And I trust that the Assembly will not judge this by who's bringing it forward. I trust they'll judge it by what it contains. Why you make one, one yeah, just, just one point. Um, uh, as to if uh, the Caglan report uh, has the vast majority of what you're speaking about contained in its recommendations and it's accepted by the, uh, the, 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 the executive to push it forward, will you, will you be withdrawing your bill? No, I'll be saying here's a good vehicle to push it forward because the Cochrane report cannot change the law. The Cochrane report can make recommendations. It will then be up to the Assembly to say, well, what are we going to do about this? Now, let me make this point. The new decade, new approach anticipates some of Cochrane by making changes to the codes, etc. Fair enough, uh, but it seems right for them to do it, but not for me. But the point I really want to make, make about that is a code at the end of the day is still only a code. It can be unmade as quickly as it can be made. And therefore, it is not a foolproof, satisfactory way to deal with something. It needs legislation to make change. Let me give you a very simple quote. It's a truism, but it bears, uh, bears repetition to you. There was a code of practice issued in GB, a statutory code of practice issued by the Secretary of State for Health under the Mental Health Act of 1983. There then was litigation about the impact and the import and effect of that code of practice. And the case went all the way to the House of Lords. And Lord Bingham said this, it is in my view plain that the code does not have the binding effect which a statutory provision or statutory instrument would have. Now that might be self-evident, but it needs to be said. Any code, no matter how good, it's not as good as a statute. It doesn't have the binding effect of a statute of provision or a statutory instrument. And codes can be changed. My goodness, we've lived through an experience when these codes were changed overnight. I remind you, on the salary scales, the salary scales in the original Code of Conduct were at the high level somewhere in the 70s. Overnight, the finance minister of the time changed them to £92,000. So codes are pliable instruments that can be changed. 
legislation, yes, it can be changed, but there's a, there's a, it's a difficult process to change legislation. It requires scrutiny. It requires investigation. So far better to put something in a piece of legislation than to put it in a code. It doesn't mean codes don't have their place. And data I remind you, you wouldn't have codes of conduct but for my first special advisor's bill. It was the 2013 Act that brought in the statutory requirement for codes of appointments, something which the questioner's party voted against. So the very existence of codes of conduct and codes of appointment are thanks to legislation I steered through this House. Now I'm saying that because some of those codes have been demonstrably broken in the past, as RHI shows, we need to go a step further. We need to have it in legislation. That's the rationale. Okay, um, Pat. Thanks, Chair. And uh, I suppose there's, there, there's always a suspicion there that Jim comes at these issues from a very negative perspective. Uh, and we all know uh, his views on the Good Friday Agreement and the institutions here. And, and many people think that Jim just wants to keep chipping away at the institutions in a very negative way. And I suppose we're, we're well used to uh, the Jim's negativity, his uh, insularity, and his uh, the way he's inward looking. But I have to say, I was very heartened in the chamber the other day to hear Jim talking about what he used to refer to as a foreign country, about how interested he was in the economy down there. You know how much the Dublin government are, are paying to the EU and so on. Mr. And Chairman, I know. That, Mr. Chairman, the member could, could speak to the subject. And, would, and, this person would be appreciated. And that's very heartening for me. That's a bit of positivity. That's a, a, a chink of light there. And, and great to see Jim. My and far. Thanks very much. Good man. Well, I do want to say this. If the, if the member isn't big enough to look past who's bringing forward this bill uh, and to look at its content, then I think that says more about the member than it does about me. Can we move to Trevor Long, please? Uh, thank you, Chairman. The computer's got tired of us. <laughs> Sorry, here we are now. Um, the, 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 as far as the preempting the Cochrane report is concerned, mm. I think it's fair to say that some of the things you want to address were actually unearthed by the Public Accounts Committee. Sorry? They, they were actually unearthed by the Public Accounts Committee before Cochrane took over. Yes, that's fair enough. So. Yeah. You, you may uh, appreciate the Cochrane report might yeah. require you to make some amendments to this, but yeah. the actual thrust of it, the things that you're trying to address to improve yeah. the situation, yeah. largely arose from what was already discovered. I think that's fair enough. Yeah. Now, the this thing's gone off. Clause 9, um, the reasonable excuse mm. for the use of unauthorised electronic equipment for, for uh, government business. Um, I think there'd be a myriad of reasonable excuses. Uh, I mean, most of us, I certainly have more than one email account on my phone. You could accidentally use the wrong one. Mm -hmm. So, is there not is there not room in there for a requirement that's, that that not only could you come up with a reasonable excuse as to why you used the, the wrong equipment, but also they should be able to reveal or be required to reveal the, the nature of the content of what was on the electronic device that you used illegally. Well, it's slightly, well, it's an interesting to say, you've got, different you've got, point. You've got, but you've got Clause 11 there, which refers to uh, revealing information for uh, which may be for financial advantage. Yes. But there's plenty of secret or confidential information that goes across the internet that doesn't actually fit that qualification. Well, yes, but this isn't addressed. This isn't addressed at a qualitative assessment of what the information is. This is addressed at the inappropriate use of the mechanism to divulge it, whatever it was, to, to pass it, whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, the issue about a, yes, you're right. Anyone could contrive in their mind a reasonable excuse, but a reason. A reasonable excuse is what we call a classic jury question. If someone's charged with an offence and there's a reasonable excuse defence to it that they seek to raise, it's a classic question for the jury. 
do you think that was reasonable? Do you believe him or her? Uh, and so within the legislation, it's not just a matter of saying, ah, I had a reasonable excuse. The court, jury or judge has to believe that it was a reasonable excuse before it qualifies as such. So it's not just a let off clause to say, oh, I had a reasonable excuse. You have to demonstrate it was a reasonable excuse. And that is a classic question for a jury to decide. And do you really expect um, uh, government ministers to end up in court over this? You know, I think the, the clause is pretty iconic. Well, actually, it's. Well, it depends how bad the situation is. I remind you, for, any, for anyone to end up in court, they have to pass the public interest test. And it was in the public interest to prosecute them. That, that will never be passed if it's some incidental, uh, mistaken uh, situation that arose. But if they were deliberately using uh, devices to maybe undermine something that government was doing or to inappropriately attain some objective, then why couldn't that end up in court? Yeah, but but the, the, the thrust of what you're trying to do with that clause, it seems to me, is to make sure that uh, government officials or government ministers, as far as possible, can't hide stuff. Yeah, that, that, yeah, 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 they so, can't hide it. So, so have, this is a deterrent not to hide it. If, if, they have, if they have attempted to hide it, is it not reasonable that they should be expected as part of their... Uh, coming clean, for the want of a better word, to uh, reveal what it was? Well, I would have thought if, if, if someone ends up at the point of being prosecuted, it's going to be part of the proofs as to what it was they were hiding. Because to show that it was in the public interest to prosecute, I think you'd have to know what it is they were hiding. So I think that is going to inevitably become part of that process. Yeah, well, so that, that would be drawn out. In the mm, court? I think so. Uh, or before you ever get there? Yeah, before yeah. you ever get there is a point I would hope, yeah. but I wouldn't like to think yeah. Yeah. any of our ministers or spads even would end up in court over this. No, but I, it, I'm not looking to lock anyone up, but I'm looking to create a real deterrent. Because we have the situation where the codes already said, the old code said, you cannot do certain things, but they did them. Mm -hmm. Now, so codes weren't enough. So now we have to step it up a gear and say, right, there now is a criminal offence if you distribute inappropriately material. Doesn't mean some people won't get away with it. You could say that of any criminal offence. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Chair. Okay, um, next on the list at the stage earlier, Trevor, Clark, was yourself, if you want to make those points. No, sorry. Okay, then we can move to Christopher. Thank you, and uh, good to see you again. Um, just in terms of uh, Clause 9 and Clause 11, hmm. in terms of the five years, people go to jail for less than that for GBH. I'm just wondering where you where the five well, years are. Uh, well, Clause 11 and five years. Again, it's a movable feast if the Assembly wants to move it, you know, and uh, if they think it's not enough or think it's too much. The five years... <laughs> I thought is sort of the bottom end of serious criminality, generally. Um, so I thought that it probably didn't merit more than that because if somebody, you know, if, if there was a really big, massive issue yeah. that touched on national security, for example, they're likely to be pro prosecuted under the Fiscal Secret Secrets Act, Act yeah. which is why the clause begins by saying without prejudice to the operation yeah. of Fiscal Secrets Act. So that's sort of going to take care of the high-end stuff. Uh, so you're dealing with more, well, I'll not say trivial, but lesser stuff. Yeah. It seemed to me five years max. Like when, a legis when, a, when five years is specified, it's always the, it's, the, it's the maximum. It's the upper end. It's the optimum. It doesn't mean that anyone uh, gets anywhere close to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. I think it's about appropriate. I thought the other matter of, uh, in Clause 11 was objectively less serious, so I set the tariff there at two years. Yeah. But and just as a, on a, gem, a general observation, I was on the, the Openness and Transparency 
element <coughs> of the talks. And I think there is broad agreement around a lot of this stuff. Mm. Um, so, and I wouldn't want you to go away from the committee thinking that that's not the case. Mm. And I think there is a broad acceptance, certainly um, someone that was elected to this place in 2016, uh, she called me Jonah Stalford, I got here and the place fell apart, but um, I think there is a broad acceptance out there in the public, the standing of these institutions is at a low, and whether it's through this vehicle or through other means, I think all of us do recognise that action needs to be taken to try and restore that standing. I, I think you're absolutely right. And I would have to say, if for just Cochrane's report um, is as shocking as some of the evidence was, and the Assembly is presented with an opportunity to begin to do something about it and says, no, thank you, I think the public will understand even less. Mm. Uh, and I think it will even damage more the public perception. Don't because I think there is an appetite and a belief that something needs to be done. Now, this mightn't be everything that needs to be done by any manner or means, mm. but I think it's a start. Uh, and I would present it to the committee, uh, not as a fait accompli, but as, a, for a second stage reading, something that is acceptable and can be worked with. And, you know, as a single member, I can't really control where this goes. It's going to be in the gift of the whole house as to where it goes. Uh, and that could be killed at the second stage, or, or it could be taken and moulded in um, different ways. But I simply present it to you as, I believe, a, a necessary starting point for this process. Thank you very much. And Christopher, you might have wrecked the place, but you did your bit in putting it back together again. So <laughs> I, know that for uh, no, I don't know whether Jim thinks that's a good idea or not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to get brownie points for getting extra questions in at question time. Um, mm. uh, so also that's us complete. Everybody has asked their, their questions. I'd like um, to thank you for coming along sure, and for uh, giving us those explanations. Um, that is certainly appreciated. And we'll um, no doubt be in contact again in the future to have further conversations. So thank you thank very you. much indeed. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, members then, what we are asked to do then, I suppose, on the um, back of that uh, presentation is there are three options that are available to us as a committee. Um, that is that we decide that we support the general principles of the bill or that we do not support the general principles of the bill. And then the third option, which is that we do not wish to form a view on the general principles of the bill in, uh, in preparation for the second stage, uh, at which, which point I would be asked as committee chair to give the committee's perspective on that. Um, maybe just to, to throw it out there and see if it circumnavigates it, um, one of the questions that I did raise was the issue of the lack of consultation that had taken place and that might be something that may be required uh, down the line. It might be an option to say that we don't form a view as a committee on the basis that the full consultation hadn't been taken. We're not ruling it in, we're not ruling it out. We're just saying that there may be some further work that's needed down the line before we form that opinion. Would that be something that members could agree with or would any other member like to... Trevor? I, I would suggest, Chairman, that we don't form a view until after the report. And then we'll see where this, I mean, that's my personal view, see where this fits after the report on the 13th. I the RHA report. Mm. So, okay, we're, we're agreed that we will not form an opinion on, on, on the... On the this uh, juncture. Yeah. Okay. But don't I agree with that? Everybody, everybody agreeing with that? Well, uh, I, I wouldn't have any problem with the situation where we agreed the general principles of the bill. See, no harm in that at all. So a nuanced position where we say at this stage we agree the general principles but await the publication of the RHI report. Yeah, that's fine, that's fine. Just um, I, as, as is being advised to me is that we have the three options which is either we agree, we disagree or we say that we can't yet form an opinion. Well, I, I disagree. I think I, we can form an opinion. I mean, I'll ask Sorry, advice, I, I didn't say there was just the three options that I said we need to clarify. I didn't right. quite understand okay. what 
we meant. So we're not buying by three options. No. Okay. Well, yeah. then we have the option of ag agreeing, but n not qualifying that until yeah. we hear some information down that. Sounds awfully like the third option, but I guess yes, it does. Um, offer it out to members to suggest a view. I didn't hear any particular disagreement with the general principles as we discussed it. Yep. Yeah, well, 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 first of all, there, there's the issue of RHI, there's the issue of the lack of consultation, and there's also the fact that the finance minister has brought forward provisions himself, uh, some of which go further than uh, the, the stuff that's in Jim's bill. So, I mean, I, I see no reason why we should be supporting it at all. I, I'm getting a, a majority sense that they're for the third option, but uh, I mean... If the, the two members that, that are disagreeing with that want to push that further towards, I can take a show of hands to see what the... I don't, think there's, I don't think there's a need to divide the committee. No. I think people recognise, as I said when I was um, speaking to Jim, I mean, you would have to have been living in a cave for the last three years. You know, people recognise the need to act and people recognise the need to try and restore confidence. Now, there's two shows in town. There's the stuff that the finance minister's bringing forward. Mr. Uh, Jim's proposal. I actually think after the RHI uh, report is published, you may end up in a situation where the two end up meshed together. So I think at this juncture, I think it's probably right that, I mean, this, is this being hand sorted? Uh, certainly it's been recorded. Yeah. People will be able to see the conversation and will know that the members of the committee recognise there is a need for action in this area where you know, the status quo is not an option. And what we're saying is that we want to see what comes from Sir Patrick Coughlin's uh, inquiry and act upon that. So I, I think the third option is, is entirely compatible with saying that we recognise the need to act and we are not, we're not rejecting the principles of the bill. We're simply saying let's, let's see what comes from Coughlin's inquiry. Sounds awfully like but it just it's the same thing I think that we're saying here. Is, is there that consensus that we are uh, well there's the difference between agreeing with the principles of this bill or agreeing with the principles of change, but waiting to see yes. what the outcomes are versus agreeing with the principles of this bill and waiting to see what yes. the outcome are. That's a slight difference. Are we prepared to I mean you're gonna be if you're gonna be called to offer a committee position, I think it's important that we say uh, we, that we, at this juncture, don't take a position, but um, in your comments, while not taking a, posi a position, you can elucidate what the committee has clearly said in this conversation. But, but are we not premature in the fact that <coughs> Jim's not bringing us forward to the second stage, so the committee's view is irrelevant until I see Jim brings us back to the floor of the house? Mm. Mm -hmm. I think it's reasonable that we will know the outcomes of the the RHI report by, because the second stage he is yes, saying will not happen, will not be brought forward speech. until after that. But, but, but in terms of forming a committee view, the yeah. committee view will not be important until after Jim brings us forward until the second stage. Well, I think. I'm sorry, I, I disagree. That this is the general principles. By all means, the Cochrane report may change the detail of the clauses. But this is the general principles, mm -hmm. and if we're not supporting the general principles, we'll have to do it on a vote chair. Would it be an option that we part the decision about this as it's a request for us to actually present something at the second stage? The second stage is not going to happen until after the RHI report, that if we have our discussion post the report, and then we will be able to decide post the report whether we feel that the general principles are something we could support or not, would that allow us to... Because we're talking about hypotheticals, but we're not giving ourselves the chance to... That's fair enough. No. No, we'll have to divide. Well, well Chairman, I'm not, I'm not sure what the purpose of dividing to find out what the minds of members is at the minute, whenever the committee has not been asked to go to the floor of the House and give a view. And that's why I would prefer to wait to we see actually what's in the report. And then this committee will be talking about it again. And we will have to form a view one way or the other. Trevor, do you make that a formal proposal? I, I propose that, Chair. I second that. 
Right. Well, then we thank you because that saves me having to ask what we're going to be voting on. So uh, the, on that basis, then, uh, could you clarify that just for? So for my proposal is given that we are not being asked for, it, we're not going to uh, to the chamber at the moment for an opinion on this. We wait until after the Cochrane report, and this committee will discuss it at a later stage, and we will form our opinion at that stage. Okay. Are all members clear on on yes. the motion that's been presented? Can I ask those that support the motion to show hands? And those against? Two. Okay, and I'm just going to clarify that. So, those in support of the motion Colin McGrath, Trevor Clark, Christopher Stalford, Fran McCann, Pat Sheehan, Emma Sheeran, and those against Mike Nesbitt, Trevor Lunn. Great. The motion's carried. Okay, thank you, members. Okay, um, item seven is the uh, forward work programme which starts at page 66 of the meeting pack. Um, now we wish to advise members that a strategic med planning meeting will be held on the 1st of April which will follow the last of our overview briefings that we have been taking. Now in preparation for that um, the clerk is going to be in contact with you with templates for completing so rather than having a series of meetings there will be a template that will give you the opportunity to fill in what you feel will be the priorities and to give some weight to those priorities. And when we bring those all together, then at that strategic planning meeting, we can assess that and work out what will be the priorities for um, the committee for moving forward. Um, so would members be content that we note the forward work plan and that those templates will be provided? Yep. Yes. Yep. And, and okay. Chair, would, are you talking about an all-day session on the first? Mm. If members wish. Yeah, just a normal meeting? I was thinking about a normal meeting. We have the Equality Commission in that day. and okay. we'll Keep it free for one briefing and then the consideration of strategic priorities after that. Okay. Um, in terms of correspondence, I refer members then to page 72 of the meeting pack. Um, and there has been correspondence from an individual redress for victims and survivors of institutional abuse. Um, are you content to note the comments that are made at this stage and consider all correspondence relating to the HIA at the strategic planning meeting? Ten. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, item nine, Chairman's business. Just to advise members that yesterday, uh, myself and the deputy chair joined other committee chairs and staff in meeting with the House of Lords EU Select Committee to discuss issues around the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, it was a good opportunity to hear the issues from the perspective um, and I felt that they did actually listen to our concerns and, and were quite keen to hear what our concerns and objections may be and that they could help to assist providing some amplification of them. Some of the issues that they'd raised regarded the cost in terms of who should actually uh, foot the bill to implement the protocol um, and then also about the level and frequency of input from um, uh, from Northern Ireland in the decision making process and also about the role that the Assembly has in scrutinising the decision making process. So it was quite a useful first meeting. We are obviously about uh, two to three years behind uh, the other uh, regions that have been able to provide updates from Scotland and from Wales. So um, we certainly will utilise as best we can uh, our influence with those individuals if it's in the benefit as this committee would uh, have a view. Um, item 10 then, uh, any other business? Is there any members that have any other business? Nope. Okay, then the date, time and place of the next meeting is here next Wednesday at 2 o'clock. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.